Thank you for having me today, and thank you for taking your lunch hour to uh, to listen uh, to my talk. I'm very uh, it's very close to my heart, uh, and I hope you find it uh, interesting. Whenever I'm introduced like that, uh, and everything Glenn said is true, I have my engineering degree and I have my MBA, but when I'm introduced like that, uh, I think always that this is what people hear. You know, it's another oil and, oil and gas executive uh, just interested in making money, and I want to be clear, that's not me. So if I may, I'd like to introduce myself for a second. When I get up in the morning when my alarm goes off, I don't think to myself, you know, Chris, you're an engineer and you have your MBA and you're CEO of this or that. Uh, you know, go do something. You know, that, that's not what drives me. So let, let me tell you what does drive me, what makes me tick, what turns my crank. This is my cottage. Glenn's been here. It's in Ontario. Uh, it's a very modest building. There's nothing particularly fancy about it. I'm showing a picture in the winter because it's easier to see. It's on a beautiful Canadian Shield Lake. Sitting on the front uh, deck there in the evening after a day of water skiing and cycling and endless chores, sitting there with my wife and having a glass of wine. Uh, that's one of my happy places in life. But what I really want to bring your attention to is the solar panels on my roof. I'm passionate about energy. I graduated in mechanical engineering at Queen's. I studied nuclear power engineering. I spent my career in oil and gas. Twelve years ago, I put solar panels on my cottage. These are thermal pan panels. They heat hot water. They don't uh, provide electricity. I have electric everything. I don't need solar panels. I was just fascinated. What's it like to have solar panels? Can you live with them? Do they work? How much heat do you get? So I installed them. If you go in my basement here, uh, there's thermometers all over the place. What temperature the glycol is going up to the roof down? What temperature the well's, water's coming out of the well? What temperature it's going into the hot water tank? I'm a bit of an engineering geek. I'm passionate about energy, all kinds of energy. I'm also passionate about the next generation. My, my generation has enjoyed the best quality of life this country has ever known. It's up to these guys to take it up to the next level, to make this country even better. That's a very high bar, that's a big task, and we have to provide these kids with everything we can so that they can achieve that. I coached ski racing uh, for 14 years with the Fernie Alpine ski team. Uh, I showed this picture because I gave a talk very similar to this one at Queen's in February, my alma mater. Uh, and two of these kids were at Queens at the time, and two other kids in the audience were also uh, former athletes that I coached. And I take no credit for their progress in life, uh, but it was great to see them there. It was a great moment for me. I'm also very passionate about this country. This is the best country in the world. This is a great country from coast to coast to coast. We are so fortunate here in Canada. The opportunities we have, the uh, freedom we have, the safety and security we have, the beauty of the landscape. This picture was taken on the Wind River when I uh, canoed this with two other families, including uh, Glens Valley. My son took this picture. And you have to put the Yukon in perspective. The Yukon in land mass is 35% larger than the country of Germany. The entire country, just the Yukon. Germany has 82 million people. The Yukon has 38,000, 22,000 of whom live in Whitehorse. This is a park. It's not officially a park, but this is pristine Canadian landscape at its best. To get to the Wind River, you fly to Whitehorse, you drive five hours north to a little town called Mayo, you get on a turbo float plane with your canoe and your gear and your food, you fly about 100 miles east, the plane puts you down on a little lake called McCluskey Lake, you canoe about a half a kilometer to the river, and then you're on the river. The next place the plane can land to pick you up is 14 days down river. Game on, you're on the river. In those 14 days, you're very unlikely to see another human being. You're not gonna see a piece of litter. You won't see a cabin, a building, a bench, a table. You won't see any signs of civilization. This is Canadian wilderness at its best. Most people like going south on their holidays. I like going north. You wanna see Canada at its best, go north. This is a great country. Let's talk about energy. There we go. This is energy scarcity. When you do not have energy, you do not have clean water, you do not have reliable food, you do not have shelter, you don't have schools, you don't have hospitals, you don't have transportation. You live in abject poverty. Too much of the world lives like this. When you do not have energy, you live in poverty. This is energy abundance. I show Mr. DiCaprio, of course, uh, everybody knows who he is. He's been here to Alberta criticizing the oil and gas industry. So have others, James Candron, James Wanda. 
And that's fine. You know, uh, we're all entitled to our views. I show this picture with the yacht Topaz. Uh, in 2014, the World Cup of Soccer was held in uh, Brazil. He rented this yacht for him and his uh, friends to uh, reside on while they went to the various uh, World Cup soccer games. So I looked up the Topaz. It's the fifth biggest private yacht on Earth. It's 480 feet long, a football field and a half long. It has two 8,000 horsepower engines, which can propel this boat at 22 knots. And any of you who are uh, at all nautical, that's really fast. To move a ship that size that fast is incredible. It has uh, a staff of 79 on it. Uh, it can hold about uh, 60 guests. Uh, it costs $650 million to build, $650 million. It has two helipads, one on the bow and one on the stern. I, uh, I point to the one on the bow here and there's one on the stern and, and you have to cut Mr. DiCaprio a bit of slack. A guy kind of needs two helipads, you know. We've all experienced the frustration of arriving on our yacht in our helicopter and there's already a helicopter on your helipad. You know, you're choking on your dome pairing, you You kind of need, you kind of need two helipads. You know, I, I joke about Mr. Cap Di DiCaprio. I've never met him. I don't know him. I've never shaken his hand. As I said, I, I hear he's a fine actor. Uh, I use him as an example, but I'll talk about it in a minute. There's a bit of Mr. DiCaprio in all of us here. Let's talk about the numbers. Uh, today, there's about seven and a half billion people on this planet. About a billion and a half, from an energy perspective, live like we do. Uh, so this is Western Russia, Europe, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. We're the lucky ones on this planet. We have abundant energy. And on average, we use 34 barrels of energy a year per person. Now, that's not all oil. That's electricity. That's natural gas. That's coal. That's tidal. That's whatever. But just translating everything into oil, the lucky ones on the planet, the billion and a half of us, we use about 34 barrels of oil a year. The next level down, so this is Mexico, Brazil, China uses about 13 and a half, let's keep the numbers around, 14 barrels of oil a year. Then there's the next two and a half billion people who use three and a half barrels of oil a year. So India, Egypt, I've given a few examples there, Philippines. As you go down here, your quality of life is decreasing, your life expectancy is decreasing, your education is decreasing, your death rate from air pollution is increasing. As you decrease your energy consumption, your quality of life goes down, your life expectancy goes down. There's almost a billion people on this planet, a billion people who use less than one barrel of oil a year. <clears throat> Most of that energy that these people use comes from either coal, wood, or cow dung. In 2018, people are burning cow dung in their homes to cook their dinners and heat their homes. This world needs energy every kind of energy. We need oil and gas, we need solar, we need wind, we need nuclear, we need hydro, we need tidal, we need geothermal, all of the above. It's th this whole energy debate has become so polarized, it's this, it's that, it's all of the above. This world needs energy. As you uh, decrease your energy consumption, you decrease your quality of life, you de decrease your life expectancy. Does anybody here think that those people, the bottom half of the population there who use four barrels or less, does anybody here think that those people don't want to live our quality of life? Does anybody here think that those people don't deserve to live our quality of life? We need to get energy to this world. If we're gonna bring the bottom half of the world's population, half the world's population to the standard of living of Mexico or China, we're going to need another 100 million barrels of oil a day. Last month, for the first time, the world oil demand exceeded 100 million barrels a day. So we would have to double oil production, assuming all that additional energy came from oil, uh, which obviously it wouldn't. Uh, but I'm just trying to keep it simple, and we're talking in terms of oil. But to, we would have to double the world's oil production to bring the bottom half of the world to the standard of living in, of Mexico. If we were to bring the six billion people who don't enjoy our standard of living to our standard of living, we'd need an extra 450 million barrels of oil a day, four and a half times what we currently produce. This world needs energy, every kind of energy, solar, wind, geothermal, tidal, nuclear, oil and gas, we need every one of the above. To put things really in perspective, the average Canadian, 67 barrels of oil a year. We use twice the average of the developed world in Canada. So why is that? Well, we're a large country. Transportation's a big deal. We're a cold country. Heating is uh, a big requirement. 
We also participate in many energy intensive industries. Oil and gas is an energy intensive industry, petrochemicals, agriculture. Uh, we manufacture cars, we manufacture steel, aluminum, potash, fertilizer. All these things take a lot of energy. We consume a lot of energy. You know, we're, there's a lot of talk now about carbon tax. Should we have it? Shouldn't we have it? And, you know, of course, people want to say we have to be responsible. Who are we kidding? We are using a ton of energy here in Canada. And part of it is because we live such a high quality of life. It's directly related to our energy usage. Because we uh, lead a quality, high quality of life, we consume a lot of energy. We think nothing of weekend trips here, there, to the mountains, camping, drum hell or wherever you go, visit your family, Medicine Hat. You know, we, we travel, uh, we, we ski, we, uh, kids play hockey, whatever. We use a lot of energy. So what does all that mean? You tumble through all the numbers. The average person on the planet today consumes 13.4 barrels of oil a year. And we emit, as a planet, 32 gigatons of CO2 a year. And of that energy, about half, a little more than half, comes from oil and gas, 54%, another quarter from coal, and then the rest, renewables, nuclear, and so on. Uh, and I don't know what your views are on uh, uh, CO2 and climate change, but uh, my own view is, uh, you know, we've been pumping CO2 in massive quantities into the atmosphere for about 150 years now, more than that, uh, since the Industrial Revolution. I, I don't believe that you can pump a that much of anything into the environment and not change it. So I am a believer in climate change, and I believe we have to do something about it. And I also believe we can't afford to be wrong. You know, how much are we willing to bet that, that it's not the cause? You know, we, we can't afford to be wrong. So where do we go from here? If we don't do anything, by the year 2040, so 22 years from now, we will have 9 billion people on the planet by then, and on average, we'll consume about 15 barrels of oil per person per year, and we'll emit 42 gigatons of CO2, so a one-third increase. Not a very good scenario. If we follow Paris, by 2040, the average person on the planet will uh, consume 11 barrels of oil a year, and we're going to emit about 18 gigatons, so a, a drastic improvement and, uh, and worth uh, fighting for, worth moving towards. So what changes? Well, coal use de declines a lot. Uh, renewables are going to make a bigger part of the equation. Nuclear has to be a bigger part of the e equation. Uh, and efficiency, efficiency, which we don't talk about very much, uh, also has to be a big part of the equation. And, but still, under the Paris scenario, 48% of global energy in 2040 comes from oil and gas. So for th to those people who say it's a declining industry, it doesn't have a future, it has a great future. Under any scenario, oil and gas is still the primary source of energy for this planet for decades to come. Renewables. I'm a huge fan of renewables, by the way. I think the technology is, is uh, ground changing. It's, it's fascinating technology. This is the growth of renewable power in the last 15 years. It, it's gone from about 1 million barrels of oil equivalent to about 9. So say 0 to 10 just to keep the numbers round. And I've shown a few projects here around the world, including the, the Pincher Creek uh, wind power facility, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And uh, this is great technology, and it's growing quickly, and the cost keeps coming down. It'll continue to grow. Uh, it's a very much a needed technology and a needed source of energy. But let's put things in perspective. This is the same renewable energy put to scale of the world energy demand. In the same time, renewables have gone from zero to 10 million barrels. Oil, natural gas, and coal have increased by 75 million barrels. Uh, of, of barrels per day of energy supply. And they continue to rise. Now, a few interesting things. Coal has dropped off. It's peaked and it's dropping off. And that will continue. There's still uh, 1,600 coal plants uh, under development on Earth. You know, we're, we're scrapping a few here, four or five in Alberta. There's still 1,600 either under development or planned. So we have a long way to go, but it has peaked. Nuclear is flat. We're still building some reactors around the world, but we're also uh, retiring some. Uh, hydro is an important renewable source, but there's only so many sites around the world for significant hydropower, so it's quite limited. So renewables will continue to increase, but oil and natural gas, and in particular natural gas, will continue to dominate for decades to come. And, you know, I, I, when you listen to CBC and the cross-country checkup and those things, you hear all these people phone in and they say, why are we building pipelines? Obviously, oil's peaked. We all know that. My neighbor bought a Prius and I wish I drove a Tesla. So clearly, oil has peaked. Oil has not peaked. Last month, as I said, we exceeded 100 million barrels for the first time in history. 
Next year it's going to be 102, then 104. It has not peaked. Saying it's peaked is a very Canadian perspective because we have energy abundance. We think everybody's like that. We are the, the huge, huge minority. So what do we do? Right now, we're spending about 1.9 trillion a year on energy on, on Earth. It's a huge business. Energy is obviously the, the driver of, of uh, quality of life. Of that, about 900 billion is oil and gas. About 800 million is renewables, nuclear, other. About 300 million is efficiency, not very much. If we do nothing else, that's uh, nothing different. That's the middle column. We're going to spend more on everything uh, for the next 20 years. If we want to meet Paris, we have to do what's on the right. We're going to spend less on oil and gas. $600 billion is still a lot of money, and we have to make sure that's spent here in Canada. We're going to spend more on renewables and nuclear, and we have to spend a lot more on efficiency. We will never get to a low carbon environment by just adding more energy. We have to use the energy we use more efficiently. This is data from the United States. Uh, I didn't have Canadian data, I couldn't find any, but this is from the year 2016. So from a data perspective, it's essentially yesterday. On the left-hand column is where the United States sources its energy, every kind of energy. And about two-thirds comes from oil and gas. In the middle is what it's used for. About 40% almost is uh, transportation. Another third is uh, industrial manufacturing things, making your iPhones, uh, making uh, all products. Uh, the last third is uh, office buildings, uh, home heating, cooking, that sort of thing. Of all the energy that's used, about a third actually goes to its intended use to move your car, to cook your dinner, to heat your office building, to manufacture your iPhone. The other two thirds is wasted as waste heat. We have to use energy more efficiently. We can't waste two thirds of the energy we use and ever expect to reach any kind of a low carbon goal. It's just not going to happen. So that's a good news, bad news scenario, because all we have to do is get more efficient, and, uh, and we're done. We have a low carbon economy, can't be that tough, you know, we, we're only using a third, surely we can do better than that. Uh, so it should be easy, except for one problem, and that problem is Mr. William Stanley Jevons. Mr. Jevons uh, was a British economist, and he wrote that uh, as technology improves to increase energy efficiency, you actually use more of it, not less of it. And this is Jevons' paradox. And he said this in 1865. So he said this in 1865. He was talking about the uh, Industrial Revolution in Britain. But it's very true today, and we've all seen this. The family car, this is not my family, but it could be. We had a car exactly like that from the time I was born. Uh, until I was about six or seven. By the way, I'm 60 years old, so those of you who are my, about my age will relate to all these things. And, uh, you know, life was good in the 60s. We had a car. We went skiing occasionally at a little provincial park north of Toronto, four bucks for the family, great deal. Uh, we went camping occasionally. My father got to work, and yeah, we visited friends. We had a car. Life was good. What else do you need? So fast forward to today your typical suburban scene. Well, what happened? Well, cars got cheaper relative to income. There's more of them. There's more roads. They go more places. Gasoline is still cheap. We all have multiple cars. You know, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm guilty. You know, I have uh, two children. We're empty nesters, but uh, I have two children and uh, we have four cars. You know, we each have a car. I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody else. Christmas lights, you know, here's a suburban scene in the 1960s. You used to go up and clip uh, Christmas lights onto your yeast trough, and it used to say in the box, don't plug more than three in a row in together because you're going to blow a fuse. And, uh, you know, there's the Volkswagen in the driveway again, and the picture's a bit dark, but there's an AMC Gremlin at the curb there for those of you old enough to remember those buttes. <laughs> so life was good. Clearly this family is in the Christmas spirit. They have their Christmas lights up. And then we came up with LED lights. Fantastic. One-tenth the electricity of incandescent bulbs. How fantastic. Think of all the energy we're going to save. <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen this. TV sets. You know, again, this is not my family, but we, it was exactly the scene in my house in the 1960s, Sunday night, Howdy Doody, Bonanza, Ed Sullivan. Life was good. You had a TV. I mean, you know, once in a while you had to run over to the drugstore and check all the tubes and make sure they worked, but life was good. So fast forward to today, you can buy a TV at Costco for $100. And, you know, I mean, again, I'm guilty. You know, my wife and I, as I said, are empty nesters. We're not big TV watchers. We tend to watch the news in the evening. We might watch a Netflix show a week. 
We're still waiting for the next series of uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, we have four TVs in our house. You know, it, it's crazy. You know, it, we're Jevons paradox. Uh, we're all guilty. It's very true. Okay, let's start talking about emissions. I've shown here where emissions actually occur from the use of natural gas and, and oil. And let's just talk about oil uh, just to keep it simple, but it's very similar for both. So the green bars in the middle. I've also put my company's logo where an oil and gas company can affect emissions. So on the oil side and natural gas, but on the oil side, about 10% of the emissions come from production, drilling, completions, your well site facilities, actually getting the oil out of the ground. About another, I use round numbers, 10% to transport it, refine it, get it to your gas station. But over 80%, let's say 80%, comes when we actually use it on combustion. So this is in our factories, this is in our power plants, this is uh, you know, agriculture, lumber, you know, whatever it's used for. This is also us flying on our Disney vacation, going on a cruise, driving, driving to get groceries, driving uh, to go skiing, camping, whatever. We are responsible, you know, personal use is responsible for 80% of emissions. If we're really going to get serious about emissions, you know, there's all this regulation going on on the oil and gas companies. We're never going to get there. We can shut the industry down. We're still going to have the vast majority of our emissions because 80% is with the consumer. So let's get serious about emissions then. Why don't we, on the weekends, shut down I'll, I'll use Toronto as an example, large population base. Why don't we shut down the 400, the 401, the Don Valley Parkway, the Gardner, and the 427 on weekends? No more driving on weekends. We're going to curb emissions. Well, now I can't go to my cottage. I can't go skiing. I can't take my kids to hockey, to ballet, to piano, to soccer. I can't go have dinner with my parents on Sunday night. Not a very attractive prospect. It's really easy to talk about emissions and to be an environmentalist when you're telling the other person what to do. It's really hard when you have to look at what to do. I'll use another example. There's probably, I don't know, 60 people here. I don't know how many last 50, let's say, 50. How many people here drive a hybrid car? One, two, two. And uh, so 4%. By the way, that's the highest percentage I've had yet. I've given this talk about 10 times now, probably. That's the highest percentage. So the hybrid cars have been around for 20 years. 20 years. Why aren't we driving them? Well, they cost a little more. It's just one more thing that can go wrong in your car. You know, it takes up a little space. Now you have to have the electric motors, battery. So, you know, you have a you crimps your car a little bit. And fundamentally, gas is cheap. You know, we. Uh, we all complain about the price of, price of gas, and uh, you know it's about a dollar twenty a liter or something right now. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, say a dollar twenty a liter. We fill up a, our tank at the gas station. We go inside. We buy a bottle of Pepsi for two fifty, and uh, we complain about the price of gas. Does anybody think that costs more to make that bottle of Pepsi than it does to make that liter of gas? And of that dollar twenty, probably fifty cents is tax. You know, gas is uh, gasoline is phenomenally uh, inexpensive. And so there's all this pressure on the oil and gas industry to do better, and rightly so. We all have to do better. And, and just because the oil and gas industry is only 10%, doesn't mean we get a, a free pass, a get out of jail free card. We have to do better too. But at the same time, our governments are putting all this pressure on us to improve. They're subsidizing the automotive industry. In January of last year, the uh, Ontario government and federal government, by the way, I'm very apolitical. I'm not picking on any governments. These are just the facts. Uh, I'm CEO of a company. I'm happy to deal with any government that's in power. It's the people who elect the government, not me. I'm happy to deal with any government that's willing to move this industry and this country forward. They gave $84 million to Honda because people weren't buying Accords and Civics anymore. They were retooling to make more SUVs. At the same time, they're regulating our industry. They, they received $84 million. Ford got $200 million from the Ontario and federal government. Uh, to retool as well, and they announced this year they're, they're uh, scrapping the manufacture of all cars except the Mustang and the Focus to build more SUVs and pickup trucks. Toyota, $220 million to build more SUVs. You know, th these are staggering amounts of money. And, and just to put it in context, my little company, Modern Resources, we're 24 people. We've been going a little bit less than six years. In the last five years, we have uh, spent, we've injected into the Canadian economy $650 million, $650 million, enough to build a yacht to the, the liking of Mr. DiCaprio. 
But we've invested it in oil production, gas production, gas plants, in, in infrastructure and resources that are going to be paying taxes and royalties long after I'm dead and gone, and I hope to live for a very long time. We spent $650 million investing in this country. Where's the Prime Minister? Why is he not shaking our hands? They, they can't get in front of the cameras fast enough, subsidizing the automotive sector. <clears throat> if any of you know the Prime Minister, you tell him he's welcome in our office anytime. We'd love to host him, we'd love to shake his hand, and we'd love to get his congratulations on what we're doing here in Calgary. You can say the same for Tango Creek. I took this picture, on my, I was riding home uh, last Friday and I stopped, this is on 9th Avenue and 5th Street, the bike lanes go right by there. So I just stopped and took a picture, and, and we're all guilty of this, you know, again, I'm not pointing fingers. It's the parking lot there, and there's, uh, it's all SUVs, there's one car, it's right here. One car. You know, when we talk about emissions, as I said, it's always really easy when it's the other guy. And, and we're all get to this. 60% of all, all of us in this room, next time we buy a vehicle, pickup truck or SUV. And that's not a Calgary statistic, that's a North American statistic. 60%. This is another good one. Uh, Suncor versus Apple. You know, people think, oh, Suncor, big polluter, big CO2 emitter. Uh, and they are a big CO2 emitter. And of course, they're working to reduce that. They're doing some great things. And of course, Apple, on the other hand, has this, uh, you know, this visionary company, high tech, it's the future. And I'm guilty too, I have an iPhone, I have an iPad, uh, I have an iPod, I have two iMacs. Like, I, I have totally drank the Apple Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, but who's a bigger emitter? You know, Apple emits 40% more than Suncor. And this is out of their 2017 sustainability reports. Now, in fairness to Apple, it's a bigger company. You know, it provides products around the world. This is the most valuable public company, uh, public company on earth. So it's a bigger company, but it takes energy. And we don't really think about it. We run out, you know, this is an iPhone 7, I think. And they come out with the new iPhone 10. People line up overnight to get their new uh, iPhone 10 so they can send higher resolution Snapchats and, and send more emojis, you know, and other important deeds. <laughs> And uh, nobody really thinks about it, that it takes a massive amount of energy to produce these things. It's made of plastic, it's made of glass, it's made of aluminum, it's made of electronics. They have to distribute it, package it, all of those things take a lot of energy, never mind actually operating it. Okay, let's talk about Canada. And I go through quite a few slides here, but if you're gonna remember one slide today, one slide, please remember this one. I've shown the top six oil producers in the world and the top six natural gas producers in the world. And I'll just run through the flags because they're not all obvious. So on the oil side, United States, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Iran, Iraq, Canada were the sixth. On the natural gas side, United States, Russia, Iran, Qatar, Canada, China were the fifth biggest natural gas producer in the world. Now there's a movement afoot, quite a powerful one, to disinvest in oil and gas. No more lending to oil and gas. There's a lot of pressure on the banks. You know, it's immoral to lend to oil and gas companies. There's a lot of pressure on institutions don't invest in the equities of oil and gas. It's immoral, you know, it's the hydrocarbon age is over. Don't invest in them. Uh, and that's fine, you know, this is a free country. It's one of the great things about our country and people can pursue whatever causes they like. But let's just take the argument to the extreme. Let's say these people are successful and there's no more investment in oil and gas. The banks won't lend to us anymore and we can't get any more equity. This industry shuts down. We need access to capital. Well, first of all, there's only two countries here you can invest in, and that's Canada and the United States. Everything else is state-owned. Uh, but again, let's just assume these people are successful. They win, we lose, congratulations. We and the rest of the world now have to get our energy from all these other countries, which is fine, and I have nothing against any of these countries. Uh, but let me ask you a few questions, and I'll include the United States in these questions, and I'm not uh, at all criticizing the United States. I'm a big fan of the United States. It's a great nation, despite some recent politics, but it's a great nation. Let me ask you some questions. If we shut down the industry here and we and the rest of the world uh, got our energy from, the, from the, these other countries, which one of these countries has higher worker safety standards than Canada? Which one of these countries has higher human rights standards than Canada? Which one of these countries has higher ethical standards than Canada? Which one of these countries has higher gender equality standards than Canada? Which one of these countries has better human rights standards than Canada? Which one of these uh, countries has better uh, indigenous consultation than Canada? Which one of, the, one of these countries has higher environmental standards than Canada? 
you know, I've had it up to my ears of some of these special interest groups vilifying not just our industry, but our country in pursuit of their own self-interest. We're good at what we do. <clears throat> We're good at what we do here in Canada. We're damn good at what we do. We are the best in the world. If you believe in any of those issues, and I hope you believe in every single one of those issues, but if you believe in any of those issues, you should be doubling down on your investment in, in Canadian energy. We are the best in the world, and it's time we stand up for ourselves. Policy. Policy can be pretty dry stuff, reams of paper, regulations, but policy is important, really important. I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to have uh, lunch with uh, Paul Martin, the former Prime Minister, and when I say I had lunch with them, there was 40 of us. I've never shaken his hand. I don't call him Paul or anything like that. <laughs> but I, he gave a talk at the uh, Ranchman's Club here in Calgary to a group of us in the oil and gas business, and since he retired from politics, he's been spending his time on First Nations issues, and in particular on the education of First Nations, and if you ever get a chance to hear him speak, uh, you should do that because it's very good. But he pointed out, he said, uh, you know, you guys should be ashamed of yourself. There's no industry in this country that spends as much time on First Nations issues and uh, consultation and opportunity for First Nations as the oil and gas industry, yet you've let your opponents vilify you with the issue and tar and feather you with the issue. He said, you have to stand up for yourself. You have to start being vocal about what you do. And uh, I thought, you know, he's absolutely right because we have the policy here and the belief that it's the right thing to do. Uh, we're going to say that we have the right policies uh, here in Canada on all community consultations. It's not uh, just Indigenous consultation, all community consultation. The other example I'll give is uh, when I was with Watrous & Co. in the uh, 1996 or 7, I can't remember, we opened up an office in London, England. <coughs> and we're sitting there on the weekend, you know, what, what are we going to do this week? And we thought, well, if we're going to get active here, we should go introduce ourselves uh, to the Department of Energy because uh, we want them to know who we are because as we get involved in transactions, uh, they should know who we are. And uh, it was called, in England, it was called the uh, Ministry of Industry. So Monday morning, I call up uh, the Ministry of Industry and I ask to speak to the Deputy Minister and I speak to his assistant and I say, you know, hi, I'm Chris Slavicki, I'm from Canada and we're setting up an office here to do oil and gas transactions and I was hoping I could come in and uh, introduce myself to the Deputy Minister. And she says, uh, just a minute. And, Ten seconds later, he gets on the line, and I, I, you know, I thought, wow, that was easy. And uh, I say the same spiel again, and I said, I'd like to come in and see you. And he said, well, how about 1.30 this afternoon? And I thought, well, great, I'll be there. So I go and see him, and uh, I walk into his office, and I say, you know, before I start introducing myself and my firm, uh, I just want to thank you for seeing me on such short notice. I call you this morning, cold call you, you have no idea who I am. And uh, here I am at 1.30 in the afternoon, I really appreciate that. And he said, well, you had me as soon as you told me you were from Calgary, Alberta. He said, uh, when we discovered oil in the North Sea here around 1970, he said, we had no idea what to do. All of a sudden, we had these billions of dollars that were going to be flooding into our country. We had no energy industry here. We had no idea what to do. So we looked around the world and we said, where is the best environment for uh, responsible energy development? And he said, my colleagues and I ended up in Calgary, Alberta at the ERCB, which is the AER today. And we spent six months working with the ARCB. We based our industry based on what you guys do in, in uh, Alberta. You're the best in the world at developing resources. And I thought, why do I have to go to London to hear that? Uh, and at home, you get vilified. You know, sometimes you have to go somewhere else to, to maybe get people to see it like it is. Here's a picture uh, I saw in the Globe and Mail just before I went to Queens in February. And, uh, this was in the report on business. It had nothing to do with any business articles, just there for its artistic merits. The palm trees in the foreground and the kind of industrial palm trees in the background uh, with the flares. And the caption reads, flames rise as excess hydrocarbons are burned at this field in Iraq. So they're producing the oil and burning off the gas. They have no use for the gas. And you know, what is an excess hydrocarbon? You know, of course, we of course conserve our gas and utilize it. This is policy uh, work. You know, people say the uh, industry here needs regulation. You know, this is lack of regulation. Uh, we should be putting these people out of business. So what are we doing about it? Uh, a lot of you know these kind of, the, many of this, so I'll go through it a little faster. Of course, uh, pad drilling. We used to drill 40 wells a section to develop uh, the underground resource. Now we can do the same thing uh, off of a single surface lease. I show it here, you know, if we spud a well at Moata Armory, we'd end up uh, up in Ramsey, uh, three kilometers deep and two kilometers across, uh, which is uh, 
uh, roughly our, the, the gas wells that we're drilling, we're drilling probably more than two kilometers across now. And of course you can go 360 degrees. So this is West Texas, what uh, oil field development used to look like. And of course today, you know, similar area, you can develop off a single site. This is not a modern site, uh, it's in BC, but uh, pad drilling. This is a modern site. We run our rigs off of natural gas and we can do that because we build our gathering systems to our site before we drill, not after. And so we run our rigs on 80% natural gas. The engines won't run on 100% natural gas, so we have to run 20% diesel. But we have fewer trucks on the road. We have uh, less storage on site. We buy way less diesel. We save a lot of money. And we, we reduce our emissions by 80%. It's a complete win-win-win. Many of these special interest groups who criticize us, uh, that's a very low bar. It's really easy to point fingers and criticize. It's a lot tougher to come up with solutions. And what we need in this world are solutions. This is a, a solution. This is something I'm very proud of. We developed something called modern ultra low em emission sites. There's hundreds of thousands of well sites in, around the world, in North America, around the world, where your uh, valves and your pumps are actuated by the pressure of the natural gas because you have no power at, at your sites. Uh, our sites are off the grid. We have no, no electric power, you can't plug in. So, you know, old school technology, you have actuators, uh, valves and pumps that run off the pressure of the natural gas and then it's released so when you walk onto a site you hear this pss, pss, and that pss is methane being released into the atmosphere. And of course methane is a very strong uh, greenhouse gas and so we have to reduce methane emissions. So we developed a modern, what we call mule sites, modern ultra low emission and uh, we run ours on 100% electrical power from uh, solar panels and fuel cells. It took us about two years to develop this now. We, we use it on all our natural gas and now our oil sites as well. We've taken our methane emissions and we've taken them to zero. There's legislation in place to reduce uh, uh, methane emissions in the oil and gas industry by 40% by 2025. At Modern, uh, I can guarantee you we're not gonna meet that requirement because we're already at zero. We call them ultra low emission because we still emit a slight, slight, slight amount of CO2, less than a newborn baby. So we can't in good faith call them zero emission, but they're uh, ultra low emission sites. Flaring, we used to uh, test wells on flare, uh, but because we build our gathering systems before we drill, we test down line. So we don't flare when we're testing. And again, we reduce emissions and we also sell the, the product, the gas and the liquid, so we, we make money. And again, these are win-win solutions. People think in the oil and gas industry we're against solutions. We're for solutions, they're great. We make money at them too. It's not counter objectives, they're, they're very complementary. And we apply this in all we do, solar panels, you know, uh, every. People think that the oil and gas industry is against solar power because it's a competitor. We're the early adopters. We've been using this for 20 years. We have to, we have no power on site. And just in the time modern has been in existence, it's unbelievable how the performance of solar panels and the costs have dropped. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's been revolutionary just in the last five years. Uh, fuel cells on, again, around North America, there are thousands of what's called TEGS, thermoelectric generators. When you need backup power, the sun's not shining, the winter, the days are short. You burn propane, run it to your TEG, you get electric power for your sites, for your instrumentation, your valves, your pumps. Uh, we don't have any TEGS. We use methanol-powered fuel cells. These two jugs of methanol here, two five-gallon jugs, that's about 18 months of fuel supply. <coughs> It's a backup to the solar, so they don't run all the time. When they do run, you can tell because the byproduct is fresh water. They drip fresh water uh, out the bottom. We don't use very many of these because the solar panels are becoming so good, but this is our backup. The, the young man in the picture there, his name is Rob. He's one of our operators. He lives in Grand Prairie. He's married. He was born and raised in Grand Prairie. Married. He has two teenage boys. We would not have developed these mule sites without Rob and his colleagues in the field. Uh, on our modern sites. It's not as if we designed it here, sent it out to the field and it just worked overnight. It took us about two years to perfect this technology. We tried some things that didn't work. We have it down pat today. And it's because of Rob and his colleagues that we were able to do this. When things didn't work at two in the morning, he was out there fixing it, telling us what's wrong, how we, we can improve it. It's because of Rob we were able to do, Rob and his colleagues, able to do what we've done with our mule sites. I have more respect for Rob than a hundred bridge dangling activists. He's actually doing something about it. He's not university educated. He went to work after high school, but he's smart as hell and he cares. I have huge respect for Rob. 
I mentioned before that we waste two-thirds of the energy we use, and that's true in our compressor at our gas plant, too. And so we used to have a building in our gas plant. It's still there. It's shut in. Uh, where we heat oil, and it heated all our buildings plus our process requirements uh, at our natural gas plant. So we installed a heat exchanger on our uh, exhaust from our compressor and shut that building in. So now we get all our heat for both process and heating all our buildings from heat recovery from our exhaust and our compressor. So again, we save natural gas. We can sell it. It pays off. We get carbon credits. You know, these are actually very strong economics uh, in doing these things. This is not a burden on us at all. And uh, I'm here in my lunch hour on my own time, so I get to brag a little bit. In June at the uh, Global Petroleum Show, Modern won the award, uh, Global Award for Environmental Excellence for the work we've done on methane reduction. And uh, there was five finalists. One of them was Saudi Aramco, and we won the award. And this is myself and four of my colleagues from Modern. And uh, as many of you know, for the last four years, uh, Saudi Aramco was planning an initial public offering. They were going to go public. And it was going to be the biggest IPO in the history of the world. Uh, Saudi Aramco is the most valuable corporation on earth. And they were going to go public. The week after this event, after four years of planning, they canceled the IPO. I attribute it directly to losing to Modern <laughs> <laughs> at the Gulf of Petroleum Show. A bit of an overreaction on their part, but so be it. My last message, courage to build. You know, LNG, are we missing the boat? We need to get building in this country again. Every single one of us in this country enjoys the standard of living we do because we've built things in this country. And now we sit here, we throw rotten tomatoes and buns at each other, call each other names, and we're doing nothing. And of course, we're all seeing it right now in the differentials in the industry, and every Canadian is paying for that. They may not know it, but every Canadian is paying for that. LNG, of course, we had the Shell announcement a couple of weeks ago, which is very positive. I'm certainly optimistic that will go ahead. But we need to get building on LNG. And of course, the opponents say that if we uh, build these LNG plants, BC's uh, GHG footprint will increase. And absolutely true, it will. It takes a great amount of energy to uh, cool natural gas to the point where it's a liquid. And it does take energy. But when you're displacing uh, coal in other parts of the world, the world benefits. And you know, greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, you know, we don't call it BC warming, we don't call it Canadian warming, it's global warming. So although we may increase BC's uh, GHG emissions with the manufacture of LNG, we're reducing in vastly greater quantities emissions in Asia who are using coal. And I show these picture, this picture of these people enjoying their evening in China dancing in the smog of coal. And for anybody here who's been to China or India or uh, other places, uh, you know, you've seen this. You know, you've seen it firsthand. It's horrific. Courage to build. This is my final message. We built this country because we had the courage to build. You know, starting with the railroad. Of course, a famous Canadian story. We all took this in elementary school. This is how BC entered Confederation. The, uh, Canada ended, ended at the Ontario border. BC said, we'll join, but you have to build us a railway. So we built a, a railway ac across this country. It was a hugely audacious project, but we did it. And to this day, we benefit from that. This is the General Motors uh, plant in Oshawa, just uh, east of Toronto. It used to be the biggest car manufacturing plant in the world. It's been there over 100 years. Over 100 years of providing cars that we all need and like. Uh, over 100 years of providing uh, employment and opportunity for people in, East, uh, in uh, east of Toronto. The Trans-Canada Highway, of course, most of you know this shot just west of Calgary. It's the main artery of the nation, still is today. Built in the 60s, connected the country coast to coast, improved people's standard of living, improved both their uh, transportation for commerce and transportation uh, for personal enjoyment. The Trans-Canada Pipeline, pipelines have made a bit of news lately. We had the guts to build this in the 50s. Gets a little colder in Ontario now, no problem. Three and a half million f homes just turn up their thermostat a little. They're, they live in comfort, they live in warmth because we had the guts to build this. We still benefit from it today. The ports, this is the uh, Port of Montreal, the Port of Vancouver, Port of Toronto, Port of Halifax, Prince Rupert, Churchill, there's others. We had the guts to build ports. It's the lifeblood of this country. It's how we export our goods. It's how we import the goods we need. Can you imagine today proposing to build a port on ocean waterfront? You'd be shut down in a nanosecond. We had a lot of guts back then. What happened to us? The Valero refinery just east of Montreal, another important piece of infrastructure. There's a few refineries out east, but this is one of them, just in Quebec City on the St. Lawrence. We import 
oil from Saudi Arabia and other places here at 70 some dollars a barrel so we can sell it our oil at $20 a barrel on this side of the country. It's absolute madness. But we need this and it's connected by pipeline to Montreal to uh, uh, west of Kingston up to Ottawa. It's how the East gets their automotive fuel, gasoline, diesel, aviation fuel. There's no talk about shutting down these pipelines because they need it. If they shut down these pipelines, this refinery, now they're not driving, they're not flying. It's really easy to talk about other people's energy infrastructure. It's a lot tougher when it's your own. The St. Lawrence Seaway, a fantastic piece of infrastructure. It didn't take just two provinces to agree here. Two countries had to agree. And we built this in the 1950s, of course, connected the Great Lakes, Thunder Bay, Chicago, Toronto, to the rest of the world, uh, and still very actively used today. James Bay, built in the 1970s in Quebec, in northern Quebec. This is why Quebec today enjoys some of the cheapest, most reliable, cleanest power in the world, because they had the guts to build this. James Bay is 16,000 megawatts, for those of you to, like me who are a bit of geek on these things. That's a lot of power. That's as much as all of Alberta generates. James Bay is 16,000 megawatts, a fantastic project. The Confederation Bridge, this is only 20 years ago, through the Northumberland Strait, connected Prince Edward Island to New Brunswick. Great piece of infrastructure, improve the quality of life for people on Prince Edward Island. 20 years ago, we had the guts to do this. Today, could you imagine proposing and building a, a bridge through an ocean strait? Again, you'll be shut down in a minute. 20 years ago, we had some guts. What happened to us? Kitimat, this is the uh, aluminum smelter in Kitimat. It was originally built by Alcan. It's owned by Rio Tinto today. This was built here because the biggest ingredient to manufacturing aluminum is electricity, cheap, reliable electricity. So you find aluminum manufacturing where you have cheap, reliable electricity. Kitimat, Arvada, Quebec, Iceland, New Zealand, that's where you make uh, aluminum. They import bauxite up the, the Douglas Channel, which is at the top of the picture. The Shell LNG site is gonna go right here. This was built in the late 1950s. It's been built, it's been making aluminum ever since, nonstop, it's never stopped. It was built here because 80 kilometers away there was a lake. They drilled a 10 mile tunnel through a mountain down to a hydro generating site, 900 megawatts of power. That's a lot of power, 600 megawatts of, of which is used here. 60 years later, BC, Canada is still benefiting from this because we built it. So the last one I'll show here, the WAC Bennett Dam. This is in Hudson Hope, British Columbia, just outside of Fort St. John. 2,700 megawatts of power when it was built. It was one of the biggest earth dams uh, on the planet. And again, BC today enjoys cheap, reliable, renewable power because we had the guts to build this. Do we have the guts to keep on building LNG and pipelines? I hope so. You know, I don't care where you live in this country. I don't care what your education is. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care uh, who you vote for. I don't care who you sleep with at night. I don't care what your views are on the uh, economy or the environment. You benefit as a Canadian every single day because we have the guts to build these things. We've got to get our courage back. We've got to get our mojo back. We have to start building this country again. So what can you do? When I talk about getting courage, what can you do? Well. If you can build an LNG plant or a pipeline, have at her, that'd be great. But in the meantime, stand up for our business. Stand up for who we are as Canadians. And when you hear people objecting, stand up with the facts, be respectful. We've had enough bun fighting in this country. It's a waste of time, it's childish. We need an intelligent, informed conversation. Write your MPs, speak to your MLAs, get out there. We need to get our courage back as a country. We need to move forward. I'll finish with this picture. I stole it from Peter Tritakian. I'm sure many of you here know Peter. I stole it with his permission, by the way. <laughs> and I just thought it's a great kind of snapshot, and Peter's a great photographer of the energy industry. It's all of the above, you know, the, the pump jack, the uh, uh, biofuel, the, the windmills. You know, we need all of the above. This planet needs energy. It needs tons of energy. All of the above. It's not just oil and gas. It's not just renewables. It's all of the above. Secondly, no one is better at providing it than Canadians. We're good, we're damn good, we're the best in the world. Let's get going. And lastly, let, <clears throat> let's get our courage back. We're, we had great courage in this country. Let's get our mojo back, let's get our courage back. Let's start building this country again. Thank you for your time.